The Fermi Paradox, Part 13 Life, a Cosmic Imperative? So, you may be wondering by now, if the rare-earth hypothesis is wrong, or at least wrongish, how does that aid the case for extraterrestrial intelligence? Where do we go from here? If Hart and the other critics of interstellar intelligence are right, then why search for it at all? Is there any evidence to counter the pessimist claims? Yes, in fact there is. And the best place to begin is with an assertion that even the authors of Rare Earth acknowledged as inarguable. That life itself is common in the universe. This assertion is not new, nor is it particularly controversial among astrobiologists. Indeed, there are a number of lines of evidence to support it. Most of us are familiar with Carl Sagan's poetic proclamation that we are all made of stardust. All elements heavier than hydrogen and helium were forged in the raging hearts of stars, then hurled into the universe by their stars' death throes, only to fall into the gravity wells of young stars, eventually coalescing into orbiting planets. Thus, there exists a physical connection between the stars, the rocks we walk on, the air we breathe, and ourselves. But Sagan's rallying cry, while true, is somewhat glib. Yes, you are made of stardust, but then so are your shoes, and so is that thing they just stepped in. In its glibness, though, Sagan's statement does conceal a genuinely staggering truth, and a far more intimate connection between us and the stars. We tend to see the Earth we inhabit as stultifyingly ordinary. We say things are cheap as dirt or common as mud. But in cosmic terms, our Earth is something of a rarity. Silicon, the second most abundant constituent of the Earth's crust, and present in 90% of any rocks you would find on the ground, is only the eighth most common element in the galaxy, swamped by such elements as carbon, seven times more common, oxygen, 16 times more common, and hydrogen, 1,000 times more common. Carbon, conversely, is nearly a thousand times rarer than silicon on Earth. When compared to the world it inhabits, which is made mainly of silicon dioxide and iron, our carbon and water-based life seems strange. But when we look up into space, it's as if we found our true home. Hydrogen, oxygen, carbon, and nitrogen, which in order make up roughly 98% of our bodies, almost exactly match the order, though not the relative abundance, of elements in the sun and other stars, particularly when the inert gases helium and neon are excluded. It's as if life were a fragment of the stars themselves, set down to infect our barren silicate rock called Earth. And as regards current scientific understanding, that isn't far from the truth. We now largely understand that the dominance of the life elements in the universe is simply a product of the method by which elements are forged within stars. Hydrogen is the commonest, simplest element in the universe, and all stars are composed overwhelmingly of that element. For most of their lives, stars fuse hydrogen into slightly heavier helium, but as they age, their cores increase in temperature, and they begin to fuse heavier elements, principally carbon, oxygen, and nitrogen. Most stars are incapable of fusing elements heavier than silicon, and no stars can fuse elements heavier than iron. The only furnaces powerful enough to forge these heavier elements are supernovas. Gigantic explosions of dying stars that briefly outshine entire galaxies. Because helium, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen are the elements which stars forge for the majority of their lives, it follows that they and hydrogen would be the most common elements in the universe. The commonest compounds, or combinations of elements in the universe, are thus combinations of these five, minus the chemically inactive helium. Carbon dioxide, carbon tetrahydride, or methane, nitrogen tetrahydride, ammonia, and of course, hydrogen monoxide, otherwise known as water, which, as the compound of the most abundant reactive element in the universe, hydrogen, and the second most abundant, oxygen, is likely the commonest compound in existence. Our own solar system is believed to contain several Earth masses of water in its comets alone, and many of its outer moons, such as Europa, a moon of Jupiter, and Titan, a moon of Saturn, are composed largely of solid water, and may even have liquid water oceans under their surfaces. Water is, of course, the key to life. Wherever liquid water is found on Earth, so is life, and astrobiologists believe the same could hold true elsewhere. Even Pluto, which is also made of ice, 
could host a biosphere if it proved to have a liquid water ocean. But life's connection to space does not end there. Comets and meteorites have been shown to be laden with amino acids, the precursors of proteins, nucleobases, the precursors of DNA, and ketones, which are related to sugars. Amino acids have even been found in interstellar dust clouds. It seems, then, that the seeds for life may be omnipresent in our galaxy, and from that it follows that life, at least in its simplest form, may be omnipresent too. But if the building blocks of biospheres are so common, why are they so rare on Earth? Conversely, why is Earth alone in our solar system for having liquid water on its surface? The answer to both of these questions is the same. The Sun. The Sun has spent the last 4.5 billion years essentially cooking the solar system, blasting the planets closest to it with heat and plasma, stripping them of their water. This was particularly true in the planet's formative phases, when water, ammonia, and other common compounds would only exist in gaseous phase as the heavier rocky materials clumped together into planets. To this day, Mercury and Venus are both barren hell worlds, and Mars, while possessed of some water, has been rendered an icy desert by its thin atmosphere. Beyond Earth and its sister terrestrial planets, above what is sometimes called the snow line, water was far enough from the sun to exist as ice, and became the principal constituent of all solid objects, from moons and asteroids to comets. And it was these comets and asteroids, in the solar system's early history, that are believed to have given Earth its biosphere. In the chaos of the early solar system, planets jostled each other and often swapped places, leading swarms of leftover rubble to cascade in all directions, peppering the larger bodies with craters that can still be seen today. It was this icy bombardment that is believed to have gifted Earth its water, which, by virtue of Earth's fortunate position, not too close to the sun and not too far away, it was able to keep. But these bombardments didn't just give Earth its water. They could have rained down all the necessary chemical precursors to life, essentially providing abiogenesis with its own complete construction kit. The popular image of space is of a barren, black, and infinite waste. But evidence suggests that biogenic processes form just as much a part of astronomy as gravity and nuclear fusion. If these processes happen here, there's no reason to assume that they are not happening everywhere. Life could be a natural outgrowth of the same processes that form and shape our universe, what Nobel Prize-winning chemist Christian de Duve called a cosmic imperative. These facts do not point the way to extraterrestrial civilizations. As noted earlier, the path from base chemicals to living things is so stupefyingly complex it is still almost completely uncharted. Nevertheless, they offer a vision of the universe in which life is not a fragile, threatened, lonely intruder, but a fundamental and integral component forged by the same gargantuan forces. But there are some who go even further than this. There are some who claim that life itself came from space. And we will be looking at that claim in the next episode.